In a recent video on my top 25 horror movies of all time, I ranked Poltergeist at number 3, just below Alien at number 2 and The Thing at number 1. If I'd made that list a few years ago, Poltergeist probably wouldn't have even made it into my top 15 horror films. And what's changed is that I've been working on and off for nearly 6 months on a detailed study of Poltergeist and have come to a whole new level of appreciation for how brilliantly conceived and executed the film is. So here I'm going to offer you some pointers to help you re-watch the film in a new light. And yes, I am recommending you go buy an original copy of the movie to that effect, if you haven't got one already. I'll start with an outline of the first five minutes or so of the movie, with an emphasis on genre deceptions. Poltergeist doesn't really start off like a horror film. We hear the US national anthem in the titles, which shifts to a TV screen within the movie. This suggests that the film might have a strong political statement. Then we're introduced to a sleeping family whose daughter appears to be hallucinating that she can hear voices in the TV set. Now this scene potentially could lead into a movie in one of several genres. It could be science fiction, it could be a kid's fantasy film, or even a story about mental illness. From here we see idyllic views of a middle class US housing estate with ever so sweet music. There's nothing overtly horror at all here, except if you rewatch the movie after having already seen the moment where a haunted dead tree comes to life and tries to abduct and eat a child, then if you're really paying attention you might notice that there's a big emphasis on leafless trees in this idyllic opening sequence. We pan from leafless trees high up on a hill, symbolic ghosts watching over the living from another dimension above. Later in the movie we'll see a cemetery up on these hills representing a spiritual higher plane as well. There's more leafless trees surrounding the housing estate. Kids play in the street as another towering leafless tree hovers over them. These symbolically undead trees parallel the undead corpses hidden under the houses, which will emerge at the end of the movie. If the music were more ominous in this opening sequence, then the supernatural symbolism of the trees would be consciously easier to notice, but the effect would be less subliminal. The film then goes on to deceive us again with childhood fantasy cavalier music showing someone riding a bike, a sequence that wouldn't look out of place in Spielberg's childhood fantasy movie E.T. This is viewed from way up above, from a spiritual plane perhaps, but when we see this person up close he turns out to be an adult. This links straight into a major theme and psychological appeal, the film taps into our suppressed memories of childhood and gets us to re-experience the magic, wonder and the fears that we once felt on a daily basis as children. At this point the tone of the film certainly isn't horror. We could easily be watching The Goonies, The Burbs, Parenthood, Stand By Me or any other feel-good comedy suburban fantasy. Most horror movies and ghost stories, they may start off with a suburban setting but you'll get the sinister music right at the beginning of the movie. So Poltergeist has broken the mould a little bit here. It's a very deceptive opening being that later on we're going to see things like this. Another smart subliminal theme is introduced here. The film will be asking us at many points to emotionally suspend our disbelief that household objects can be moved about by supernatural forces. A very small matchbox vehicle just rolled seven feet across a linoleum surface. The determination as to whether your home is haunted is, is not very easy. I... So by showing us toy cars moving about by remote control, which is something we know to be real, the seed of plausibility regarding telekinetic movements of objects by ghosts is implanted in our minds. And later in the film we get the same thing in a more sinister way. After Carol Ann is abducted by ghosts, a toy robot creeps forward, mischievously laughing, and obviously that's a metaphor for the ghosts laughing at having taken the child away. In this instance a conceptual bridge is being made between objects being moved by magical forces and invisible but entirely believable electrical forces. That same metaphor will be used again in the next scene after the bike road opening. Two families find that their remote controls are affecting each other's TVs. Unseen force is causing conflict, but it's not done in an overly dramatic way. This is sneakily presented as light, suburban comedy rather than a bold, dramatic statement. And that's more subliminal. 
In the bike instance, the toy cars causing the guy to hurt his groin on his bike seems far too accurate in terms of the remote control driving by these kids. But it's a little foreshadow that the interference of unseen forces in the story can be a physical threat to the living. Don't forget, Poltergeist wasn't made for kids, yet the psychological devices of kids' movies are being employed in these opening scenes as a deceptive subliminal setup for supernatural horror themes that will come later. As this guy finds the front door of the main house of the story to be locked, we get an elevating view of its surrealist roof structure. Attics and basements are very often used in ghost stories to represent spiritual places, be they light or dark. Now, this house has no basement, which is unusual in ghost movies, but the roof structure makes it look like the house is almost entirely an attic, like its very foundation is tied to a higher spiritual plane. From here, Poltergeist doesn't rush into being a horror film. It takes its time establishing a very believable middle-class family context and links us in emotionally with that family. Spielberg's unparalleled ability to tap into childhood realities and family bonding is a major strength in Poltergeist. As viewers, we're made to feel like a part of this family because we can identify from our own real-life experience as kids and as adults that a lot of the details here are accurate to life. Food fights feeding the dog under the table, kids arguing about nonsense, younger kids struggling with the concept of death, kids being afraid of objects in the dark at night. The actors aren't familiar movie stars either, and that's good because it makes them more believable. And they're not fashion model types, though I personally thought that Joe Beth Williams was a babe even when I saw the movie as a kid. Booktoothed Robbie is particularly geeky looking, and Carol Ann, while being a lovely kid, isn't the most stunning kid. Some of the best horror movies do this. They set up a thoroughly convincing context and believable characters first, and then gradually introduce the supernatural silliness. But Poltergeist does it better than any other horror movie I've seen. The emotional investment in the characters then makes the audience willing to suspend their disbelief. Even for a ghost story, Poltergeist goes pretty far in bending our acceptance of what's plausible. The usual ghost tropes are there, like objects moving on their own and semi-transparent apparitions. But coffins shooting out of the ground, cupboard portals into other dimensions, one of which swallows the entire house at the end, people trapped inside TV sets, toys that come to life and attack people. Poltergeist does all this and amazingly remains thoroughly engaging right up to the end of the film. And it's not just due to the advanced establishment of convincing context either. The whole film is full of deceptive reminders in relation to unseen forces that are actually a part of our daily experience in real life. Electronics and signal transmissions of TV broadcasts are things that the majority of us know next to nothing about scientifically, and yet we believe in them because we see the results on our TV sets and in all the other electrical gadgets in our lives. So Poltergeist cleverly attaches its supernatural premise to the unseen forces in our lives that we already 100% accept as being real. This is such a clever piece of psychological trickery, a central plank in what makes the movie work at an emotional acceptance level. Another device the film uses to lock us emotionally into the narrative is by playing on our parental instincts. Most adults feel deeply distressed if they see children suffering and they have an overwhelming instinct to intervene and help the child. So when Poltergeist suddenly ramps up the surrealism to levels that we would usually laugh off in a lesser movie, it does so in immediate and direct relation to children being in danger. Robbie and Carolina are attacked and so we can't help but feel empathy for the kids and feel the anguish of their parents even though what's happening is something we know to be physically impossible. So I'm being swallowed by a tree, ah that's stupid, but oh my god he's just a kid. And I think another dimension to this is that because we empathise with the kids in these situations, the film is tapping into our childhood capacity for believing in monsters and ghosts, as well as tapping into our parental fears. Poltergeist really goes for the emotional kill in these scenes. Not once have I ever been able to watch this film and not have a lump in my throat as the family frantically search for their missing youngest. <laughs> This is all added to by the fact that the family are wet and covered in cold mud. It's like their emotional shock and anxiety is being represented at the physical level. 
Add to that the anxiety-inducing strobe light, which is incidentally justified by the television set. The film is constantly firing off metaphors through sound, music, lighting, camera angles and movements, set designs, subtleties of dialogue, and via all the other tools at the filmmaker's disposal. As an example of how superbly crafted the emotional engagement is, go get yourself a copy of the movie and watch this scene. The family and the psychic are trying to communicate with their daughter who is trapped in another dimension, and for some reason they all feel the need to look up into roughly the same portion of ceiling as each other. That doesn't make any sense physically, but it creates a scenario where each character has to step forward and speak their most emotional lines up close to the camera so we get the full impact of their acting. And the performances are all excellent in the film. As they each step forward to speak, the camera glides up and down to accommodate their differing physical heights and adjusts its angle to keep the other characters in shot, so we're getting multiple emotional reactions on screen at once. We love you so much. Please just say hello. She's under restraint. What? Who, who's restraining her? There are many arms about her. She thinks it's safe. Quickly, who is she more threatened by, you or your husband? Carol Ann, you answer your parents or you're going to get a real spanky from the both of us. <laughs> Run to the light, Carol Ann. Run as fast as you can. Mommy is waiting for you. I hate you for that. Now clear your minds. He knows what scares you. It has from the very beginning. It's a very impressive single shot sequence, much more effective than cutting back and forth between different camera angles. Another dimension is that Poltergeist plays very clever games with regards to our dual fears and hopes about the afterlife. Most human beings are so afraid that death might be truly the end of our existence that they seek comfort in often destructive religious institutions and attempt to calm their anxiety about the potential void of nothingness. But at the same time, people fear ghosts and demons, which, if they do exist, would prove to us that death isn't the end. And so supernatural horror carries a thread of hope regarding our desire for everlasting life. Lots of ghost stories and horror films play on these twin motivations, even if the writers aren't consciously aware of it. But Poltergeist is a bit different because it taps very heavily into our fears about the death of our loved ones. Grief is another extremely potent emotion for human beings. So, Carol Ann has been abducted by mysterious otherworldly forces, but that plot framing includes connotations that our loved ones aren't forever lost when they die. Some people believe that when people there's a wonderful light, as bright as the sun, but it doesn't hurt to look into it. All the answers to all the questions that you ever want to know are inside that light. And when you walk to it, you become a part of it forever. So there's a very strong wish fulfillment undercurrent in Poltergeist. Before I finish, I'm just going to outline some more of the movie's subliminal sophistication in terms of details. It'll be a little bit scattershot, but this is just to give you a general idea. One thing to look out for is the many surrealist pictures in the house. They are quite suggestive of family bonding, other dimensions and childhood thoughts. The windy stairs here intruding into the lounge are very unusual, a conceptual deviation from the angular features typical of construction logic. These stairs are literally used as an interdimensional gateway in this scene. The infamous clown attack involves a few subliminal things such as its facial expression changing to an evil grimace. Though there are never any sexual threats toward the children in the movie, Mother gets sexually attacked and in the build-up scenes in the bathroom, the camera work and the presence of the dog watching her undress suggests an unseen presence is spying on her with sexual intent. And here's one for all you fans of The Shining. Many of you will be aware that Spielberg's movie Ready Player One actually involves characters entering a simulated reenactment of The Shining's Overlook Hotel, and one of the characters goes into room 237. In Poltergeist, when the ghosts come out of the TV and into the house, the TV time displays 2.37. It does that in the first few shots of the scene that show the close-ups of the TV, 
and then the time jumps back and forth between shots but always just after and in close proximity to 2.37, as if the TV time had been repeatedly set to 2.37 while shooting and had been allowed to roll forward a few times as they were getting the shots. I was 50-50 on whether this was accidental, but then I noticed that a hotel room 217 is shown prominently in the very last shot of the film. 217 was actually the number of the Overlook Hotel's haunted room in Stephen King's original novel of The Shining. So, 217 and 237 make prominent appearances in Poltergeist, which was released just three years after The Shining was. It's worth noting that Spielberg had a lot of contact with Kubrick during his career, and that just prior to shooting Poltergeist, Spielberg had filmed portions of Raiders of the Lost Ark in Pinewood Studios in England while Kubrick was shooting The Shining, and I'm pretty sure it was the unauthorised biography of Spielberg that features details of the two directors interacting during that shoot. In fact, when the Colorado Lounge set of The Shining burned down in an accident, probably caused by the ghostly twins, the reconstruction of the studio space was built a few metres higher to accommodate the Well of the Souls set in Raiders of the Lost Ark. So there's certainly scope for cross-pollinization of ideas between the two movies, and eventually Spielberg directed the incredibly subliminal movie Artificial Intelligence, which was conceptually developed and partially storyboarded by Stanley Kubrick. So there has been a lot of cross-pollinization between Kubrick and Spielberg, just as George Lucas's multiple collaborations with Spielberg have resulted in multiple Star Wars references in Spielberg's films, including in Poltergeist. Poltergeist is an amazing film, full of technical and artistic wizardry that to my knowledge has largely gone underappreciated. I've got enough interesting material about the movie to make at least a 90 minute runtime analysis video, but this video you're watching is just an introduction. So go get yourself a copy of Poltergeist and give it another watch with all this stuff in mind. Thanks for watching. You've been listening to Rob Ager. More videos and articles on filmmaking and psychology at my website, collativelearning.com.